Hey everybody, and welcome to D&D Horror Stories with D&D Doge. In today's video, we have a story about a dungeon master that gets jealous when a female player private roleplays with another player so he can practice, and threatens her character unless she private roleplays with him as well. A story about a Dungeons & Dragons game that has stuff from Game of Thrones, Avatar The Last Airbender, and Lord of the Rings to name a few where a 45-year-old Game Master attempts to roleplay SA with a teenager, and more. But before we get into these stories, I definitely think that we are going to need some bardic inspiration from Lucky to help protect ourselves from the psychic damage that these stories are sure to induce. Hey Lucky. Thanks Lucky. Now I think we are ready for some D&D horror stories. Homophobic Creep Dungeon Master Bullies Teenager by Reddit user ConsciousResult650 So I play D&D with a group of friends and my cousin. My cousin is a lesbian and a teenager by the age of 15. This is unfortunately relevant to what happened. This recent campaign, that's no longer going on, involved a newer, quote, friend that I met through the game shop. He was an older player, about 45-ish, and a veteran dungeon master, and had a fairly good reputation. I had played in a few one-shots he ran, so when my D&D group, made up of friends and cousins, all came to this game shop, it was only natural that we got this guy to Dungeon Master for us. Boy, was that a mistake. So, we meet for Session Zero, and the Dungeon Master lays out the rules and establishes the setting. Nothing out of the ordinary. It was to be set in a world that utilizes maps from Game of Thrones, Avatar The Last Airbender, and Lord of the Rings, with a hodgepodge of inconsistent lore splattered across, i.e. a fire-bending R'hllor worshipping Targaryen Dark Lord looking for the One Ring. Jeez, why not throw in some Harry Potter or The Witcher for good measure at that point? The problem came when we rolled up our characters. Most of us played some variation of Orc or Elf. I was personally a half-elf barbarian but my aforementioned cousin decided to play a female tiefling druid who was married to a woman. None of us took issue with this, except the dungeon master who made an offhand quote joke about scissoring. I am embarrassed to say that I didn't know what that meant at the time, even though I definitely should have. The BBEG was basically the aforementioned Dark Lord, and our job was to travel the globe looking for magic items to prevent him from taking over the world. We had about four sessions before I noticed the disproportionate amount of homophobic NPCs and DMPCs who would target the tiefling druid. A couple of them even attacked us. One time, after she talked about her and her wife's adopted daughter, he just had to bring in a whole ass DMPC to object. I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, No way, you two got a baby? You're literally gay. As he started laughing his ass off. He then said, Magic ain't gonna make a baby out of two holes. And started laughing again like an ass. I glared at him, and he said, What? It's true. It's basic biology. I ended up making an excuse for us to leave early that day. After that session, I asked my cousin if she wanted me to talk to him because I was ready to lay into his ass. I told her that we can find another game. She said, Nah, please don't. He's probably in the closet himself. A lot of guys like that are. Plus, sometimes characters can be a-holes. It's part of D&D. So I agreed not to talk to him, to respect her wishes. But then, it got worse. A few sessions later, we ended up going to a dark empire over the ruins of what was once Mordor, ruled by a lich emperor. 
He had an important magic item that we were looking for, and he was supposedly a mixed bag and not totally evil. But when we got there, we were arrested by his army of mind flayers who read our minds. Apparently, as we were being investigated, the mind flayers bring up the fact that my cousin's character is gay and married to a woman. They apparently hated gay people and threatened to TPK us over it, but instead, they brought us to the Emperor to decide our fate. Once we reached the Lich Emperor, he also made his disdain for gay people very clear. He said, I don't tolerate homosexuals in my realm. Gay men are summarily executed, but lesbians? What broke me was when the Dungeon Master Deadass looks at my cousin with a disgusting grin on his face, and, in character, says, We can fix lesbians. They just need to know what a real man feels like. Mind flares, hold her down. We all look at him with disgust, and at that point, I said, Oh, hell no, we are not doing this. And I told him, in no uncertain terms, that we are leaving and not coming back. The dungeon master then tried to walk it back and said, What? It was a joke. Come on, don't tell me you're really going to rage quit over this. I refused to listen and just grabbed me and my cousin's things. Thankfully, my friends all backed me up so there wouldn't even theoretically be a chance for my cousin to give him the benefit of the doubt and stay in the game. The campaign ended right then and there. My cousin did thank me at the end and said that she wouldn't want to play with him again after that. And later, we did find a better DM to play with. TLDR DM won't stop commenting on my cousin's sexual orientation. Eventually makes a comment so disgusting that I forcibly ended the campaign. Now, while I can understand throwing in themes of homophobia and homophobic characters, that is something that should be discussed in a Session Zero. Having homophobic characters that the party can fight against is a decent way to make some villains, if done the right way. But, as this story sounded, the Dungeon Master was going a tad overboard with it. Then he really crossed the line when he implied that Opie's cousin's character was about to be essayed which is even more sickening when you consider OP's cousin was just a teenager and the Dungeon Master was 45. Good on OP for stopping it right then and there and getting their cousin the heck out of there. Thankfully, it sounds like OP and their cousin have since found better games to play in. But with that said, let's move on to the next horrible story. Dungeon Master threatens me with killing off my character if I didn't roleplay in private chat with him. By Reddit user, Martha Lawrence. I have always been interested in D&D and tabletop RPGs, but until last year, I had only been able to play one-shots with some of my friends. So, when a guy I had met through some friends offered me a spot in his D&D campaign, I was ecstatic. We were going to play on Discord since another player had recently moved a few hours away. The party consisted of, names have been changed, obviously, the Dungeon Master, a guy in his mid-twenties who was constantly bragging about how everyone always loved his campaigns, Sean, a pretty chill guy, also mid-twenties, with whom I still talk to sometimes. He played a human barbarian. Mark just turned 20. He was a human draconic bloodline sorcerer. He was also AUDHD, autism and ADHD, and kind of a murder hobo. After I talked to him, after he almost got killed on the first session, he tried to improve. Me, 19, was playing a half-elf warlock with a homebrew patron, which really wasn't. The dungeon master just took things from the Undying Patron. We were supposed to also have a cleric in our party, but she missed the first two and only sessions because she had to work and our dungeon master was just too busy to reschedule both sessions. 
So with the premise of us being on a chariot going to a city, we start the campaign. We're not even five minutes in, and a group of ten bandits attacks us. With just the three of us, two being casters on top of that, we barely make it out alive, but that's enough for our characters to decide to stick together. The Dungeon Master laughs about us being nearly TPK'd, saying that he was glad that he didn't stick to his original idea, a pack of 50 wolves instead of the bandits. During this fight, I start noticing that he had a pretty clear favoritism for my character. He never attacked me once, claiming that Mark and Sean's characters were in the way of the bandits, despite half of them having bows. Not only that, but whenever I used Eldritch Blast, he never made me roll, and it would instantly hit. And despite me trying to tell him that that wasn't right, he just replied with, I always help out low-level characters. I just decided not to use the cantrip, because it wasn't fair to the other members of the party. We arrive at the town, and Mark's character decides to flirt with the innkeeper. However, her husband comes in and demands all of his gold because of the humiliation of Mark trying to get with the innkeeper. At that point, Mark decides to just kill off the husband, despite me and Sean trying to stop him. When we tried to persuade the high priest of the town not to kill Mark's character, we only succeed when it's my character speaking. It was as if Sean's presence wasn't even acknowledged by the DM. Again, I decide to let it go and we get tasked by the High Priest to kill the bandits that live in the area. If we succeed, he will drop Mark's charges, which I didn't find so believable, since he killed a person. The first session ends there, and I decide to speak to Mark about what happened. He had a terrible meltdown, saying that he should just quit D&D because he ruined everything for us and he was sorry. I talked him out of abandoning the campaign, and he asked me if we could try to roleplay in character, in a private chat, so that he could try to improve. I was okay with that, but still stood my ground about not wanting anything sexual in our roleplays, as I wasn't comfortable with it, and he agreed with me. So, for the next week or so, we hopped on Discord, and I acted as a fake dungeon master for Mark, presenting him with different situations. Nothing too specific just everyday things. I'm a terrible DM. All in which, he needed to act in character. He actually improved a bit and stopped acting like a murder hobo. One night, all four of us meet up on Discord to chat a bit and talk about the previous session. Both Sean and the Dungeon Master notice how Mark is just better, accepting criticism. He had a hard time doing that and being generally more confident, and they were pleasantly surprised. He told them what I had been doing for him, and the Dungeon Master reacted weirdly. He got out of the call immediately and messaged me in private to talk about what Mark had said. At first, he was scared that I had been, quote, revealing to Mark what we had decided for my character, but then he just started complaining on how we had done this behind his back, and how he felt left out of our, quote, private sessions. Dude, it's not like they were role-playing the characters in the DM's campaign. It was just practice for Mark to get better at role-playing. I assured him that I just wanted to help Mark improve with his role-play, and then Dungeon Master asked me to do the same with him. I tried to say no, but he threatened me with killing off my character if I didn't. Dude, what the heck? That is not normal behavior. I would have threatened the Dungeon Master back at that point that I would quit the campaign if he wanted to act like that. So I just accepted, with the same rules applying for him. That is, nothing sexual. Dungeon Master assured me that he understood completely and that he wouldn't do anything that I didn't like. Spoiler alert, he does. And so, it began. The first time, everything was okay. He presented me with some important NPCs that we had met during our first session, 
and I acted in character. Nothing much. However, these, quote, private sessions, as he called them, had started to become more important than the actual campaign. We had to wait more than a month for our next session, because the Dungeon Master, quote, still hadn't improved enough. I was starting to get annoyed, and so was Sean and Mark, and we pressured the Dungeon Master to tell us a day that we could actually play. He told us to wait two more weeks, and then we would play. In the meantime, he kept asking me to roleplay with him, and I did. Now, I know I was dumb and wrong for enabling him, but I just didn't want to risk the campaign being shut down because of me. His NPCs had become more flirty with my character, which I did not like at all, and tried to dismiss it, until he asked me to roll a constitution saving throw, which I failed with a 19. He went on to describe how my character was suddenly feeling dizzy and just blacked out. When she woke up, she was tied to a bed, and the Dungeon Master's favorite NPC was basically raping her with the Dungeon Master explaining in detail what was going on and what my character felt. I know I say this a lot, but what the fuck? I immediately got off the call when I understood what was going on and messaged him that I was not okay with what he had done. He replied that he was sorry, that he just wanted to try out a few new mechanics. What new mechanics involve that? New mechanics that implied being essayed? I just told him that if that was the case, I didn't want to play in the campaign, but he just assured me that he wouldn't do it, and that since he broke my trust, we could stop roleplaying in private. The next evening, our second session rolled in. I was very uncomfortable, but I didn't want to quit without telling Sean and Mark what had happened and I didn't want Mark to think that it was his fault for telling the Dungeon Master that we were role-playing in private. So I decided to do that session and leave the party afterwards. Dungeon Master decides that, for that night, we would have a part of the session where it was gonna be just me and the Dungeon Master for seven minutes. Just like that stupid game, Seven Minutes in Heaven. I just accepted it, thinking nothing of it. I was wrong. Once again, he had multiple NPCs attack me and try to rape my character. But before they could do anything, Dungeon Master's favorite NPC arrived and saved her. I told him that that was the last straw. He could kill off my character because it would have been better than to sit there and let him use her for his weird abuse kinks. I told Sean and Mark what happened that same night and both of them started a mission of exposing him to all his other D&D groups. He ended up losing all of his campaigns, both as a player and as a DM, and also thanks to another female player who had the same experience with him. She was scared that, if she told anyone, he would do something to her. But my friends standing up for me were enough to convince her to come out about it. I still hang out with Mark and Sean whenever we can, that is, when Mark comes back to visit, and they are amazing people. Mark is actually trying to convince me to start up my own D&D campaign, and who knows, maybe someday. Sorry for the long post, I just wanted to share my story, and to whoever had similar experiences, both in tabletop RPGs and in real life. Please, tell someone. It's never good to keep these kinds of things private, even when it's just a game. Well, I couldn't have put it any better than OP did at the end there. Never let anyone get away with that type of thing. The first red flag with this Dungeon Master was when he was purposely avoiding hitting OP in battle and not making her roll for Eldritch Blast. Then, when Mark's character killed the innkeeper's husband, and the high priest of the town would only listen to Opie's character, that was showing blatant favoritism. Then, for the dungeon master to get that upset when he found out that Opie was doing private practice sessions with Mark to help him to get better at roleplaying, 
and then threatening to kill OP's character, unless she did so for him, is a huge red flag. In all honesty, OP should have just quit the campaign right there, in my opinion, because that really speaks to the maturity level of the Dungeon Master, and would be a clue on how he would run a game. But still, she agreed to do so, but did state that she didn't want to do any erotic roleplay. And even though DM agreed to it, he pulls the crap he did, then tries to do the same thing during the second session. OP did the right thing by leaving right then, and telling the other players about it, and good on them for doing what they did and reporting this Dungeon Master for that crap. Heck, it even inspired another one of the Dungeon Master's victims to come out and tell her story about the DM doing the same crap to her. It's good to hear that OP and the other players still keep in touch, and hopefully, OP will run that game for them if she decides to and I guarantee that they would have a much better time. Let's move on, and I think we need to end with a bit of a lighter story compared to the ones we just went through. Player so obsessed with one campaign setting, and one race in particular, that she gets tunnel vision. By Reddit user, Last Chocolate. Hello everyone. I'm not sure if this counts as an RPG horror story per se, but it is worth a shot. For a little bit of context, I started playing D&D back in 1999 and 2000, when 2nd edition was slowing down, and 3rd edition was right around the corner. When I joined this person's campaign, I knew nothing about D&D or the Forgotten Realms, but I know better now. My dungeon master was Sarah. She was a great storyteller, and very knowledgeable of the rules. She loved Forgotten Realms, and thought the drow were cool. For me, no red flags yet, but I didn't know better. Over the years, however, I learned more about the setting and the drow, and I discovered a lot of things were wrong. But there were two big things. First, almost all the drow in her setting were good, a player character couldn't sneeze without a drow priestess of Elistri saying, Bless you. To go with that, her drow pantheon, which had about six good deities and Loth, had temples pop up almost like Pokemon centers in those games. They were everywhere. Second, she was obsessed with Dritz. She Mary sued herself into Faerun as a silver dragon who was married to Dritz and has children all across the continent. Why are these details important? Because she was so obsessed with Drow and Faerun that if she was invited to other games, the conversation would go something like this. DM, hey, I'm about to start up a campaign. Are you interested? Sarah, can I play a Drow? DM, no. Sarah, why not? DM, because I'm running Dragonlance, Drow don't exist. Sarah, why are you running Dragonlance? You know I like Faerun. DM, because this is my campaign, not yours. Sarah, can I make a Drow and say I somehow plane shifted from Faerun? DM, no. Sarah, can the game plane shift to Faerun? DM, no! Sarah, then I'm not playing. DM, okay, bye. Eventually, people just stopped inviting her to games, because this would be the conversation every time. Even non-D&D games would have this conversation. She even went so far as to try and convince me to let her play a drow in 3rd edition Legend of the Five Rings, with stats made up and everything. To my knowledge, now, the only time she can play her precious drow in her precious setting is when she plays D&D &D with the two people she hasn't pissed off with her obsession. TLDR Player is so obsessed with drow and forgotten realms that she refuses to play literally anything else. Yeah, I could see how that could get annoying after a while. 
You would think that she would want to try something different from time to time in regards to setting and player characters. But hey, to each their own. And if that is the only thing she wants to play, more power to her. But it will only limit the games that she will be able to play in. Not the worst horror story that I've read, but with those last ones, I think we needed a lighter horror story to end with. Speaking of which, that is all I have for you today. As always, I appreciate all of you, especially if you like and subscribe, and may your games remain horror story free. Until next time.